Thank you for your questions regarding hydroxyapatite safety in oral care products. There's been a lot of chatter regarding the EU ban and the blood-brain barrier on the internet. A lot of it conveniently by companies that either don't use hydroxyapatite at all or are using the microcrystals. So we wanna address these topics. Safety is Dr. Jen's number one priority. And so we're gonna share with you what the research actually says on hydroxyapatite so that you can share it with your patients when they have concerns. We're gonna go over it. As a review, there are four shapes of hydroxyapatite found naturally and synthetically. Needle-shaped hydroxyapatite crystals have not been tested for safety in toothpaste or mouthwash. So it is a good idea to exercise caution regarding this shape. However, the rod and the natural amorphous shapes have been tested for safety. 99% of the nanohydroxyapatite in toothpaste is made with synthetic crystals. The European Union released a public opinion in 2023 that really offers the basis to alleviate concerns regarding nanohydroxyapatite safety in toothpaste. Their conclusion indicates that at the specified concentrations and characteristics, of which Dr. Jen oral care products do adhere to, concentrations of up to 10% in toothpaste, particle shape being rod, and particles not being coated or surface modified, that nanohydroxyapatite does not pose a genotoxic risk, meaning it is safe to use in toothpaste at any age. Additionally, the naturally derived eggshell nanohydroxyapatite used in Dr. Jen's oral care uh, eggshell toothpaste has undergone safety testing with the following conclusion as well. Eggshell derived nanohydroxyapatite showed no toxicity toward human osteoblast and fibroblastic cell lines, even increased cell viability. So this is the research demonstrating that in oral care products, nanohydroxyapatite is safe to use provided these certain parameters. Regarding the EU public opinion, the following year in March of 2024, the EU amended the use requirements of nanohydroxyapatite to include a restriction on sprayable products. So the comments on the internet do have a kernel of truth. There is an active ban on nanohydroxyapatite in the EU, but it's specific to aerosolized products due to concerns about aspiration into the lungs. In oral care products like paste or gel or varnish, it's not really a concern because by the time they're on your toothbrush, the paste, the, the, the particles are already in a liquid form. So this is an irrelevant ban when it comes to toothpaste. Now, regarding the blood-brain barrier, most concerns about nanohydroxyapatite stem from studies that have been taken out of context. The research that's been done focuses primarily on engineered nanoparticles for targeted drug delivery in things like central nervous system diseases like Alzheimer's. These nanoparticles are designed to actually penetrate the blood-brain barrier, and they're also administered differently than nanohydroxyapatite in oral care. So as of now, there is no evidence to suggest that nanohydroxyapatite from toothpaste can actually cross the blood-brain barrier. For a substance in an oral care product to penetrate, we have to ask, how is it going to get there? And we have two options, the gut or the oral mucosa. Passing through the gut is highly unlikely because stomach acid, which has a pH of 1.5 to 3.5, dissolves nanohydroxyapatite, which has a dissolution pH of four. So it's not gonna to get to the brain from the gut, but what about the oral mucosa? This histological study demonstrates that the body's own defense mechanisms can help protect it. This study placed 10% nanohydroxyapatite, 50 nanometers, on soft tissue for 24 hours and found that it did not penetrate either the keratinized or the non-keratinized soft tissue. So systemic absorption of nanohydroxyapatite from toothpaste, either through the oral epithelium or the gut, really does appear unlikely. Now, what about um, bands? On, what about microhydroxyapatite? Currently, there are no bands on micro, so why not just use it? Well, the short answer here is efficacy. This research article demonstrates a scientific consensus supported by 37 research articles that microhydroxyapatite crystals, which are not only 30 years older, significantly cheaper, but also an ineffective technology at arresting incipient decay. So you can get some surface level remineralization from a micro, but because they are significantly larger than enamel hydroxyapatite and dentinal tubules, and when the ultimate goal of hydroxyapatite is biomimicry, this makes them less effective in remineralization and reducing sensitivity. 
So sadly, because hydroxyapatite is not regulated in the US, even though we've got widespread scientific agreement that nanocrystals outperform microcrystals, brands continue to use the microhydroxyapatite. It's a cost saving, it's a cost saving measure. But as we're seeing, it is being disguised by marketing claims about the safety concerns of nanoparticles, unfortunately. So Dr. Jens holds safety as its number one priority, but right behind it is efficacy. If we're not going to give our patients a toothpaste with an effective remineralizing ingredient with optimal 10% concentrations and in the nanoparticle size, that is going to put these patients at a higher risk of caries. And thankfully, we can have both. We can have a toothpaste that's not only safe to use at any age, but also has optimal anti-caries protection. And that's what you get with Dr. Jen Oral Care products. So thanks for listening. I hope this review and the re of the research helps. Please reach out if you have any further questions. Um, we'd, we'd love to help. Thanks.